Have you heard of this saying, innovate or die? This quote inspires people to embrace new technologies, seek new solutions, and stay competitive. Imagine we're in a fancy convention center in a large city, and we are talking to high-tech companies, executives. These people live and breathe innovation every day. When we say, innovate or die, they will respond to us enthusiastically. Yes, innovate. We're not going to lie down and die. We will survive. And now let's imagine we move our stage from this large city into a small town with only two stop signs and four churches and a few thousand people. And you say, innovate or die. How will the crowd respond back to you? Is he okay? <laughs> Bless his heart. English is not my first language. It took me a while to figure out how to use the bless your heart properly in the South. So you see, people would not associate small towns with innovation. When we talk about smart cities, we think of San Francisco, Boston. We don't think of a small town with only two stop signs and four churches. I love small towns. And I love doing weird things, AKA innovation. This talk is about how to reconcile these two things, small towns and innovation. I was born and raised in a small town in China. It's famous for one person, and I bet you know her name. Her name is Mulan, the Disney princess. Yes, she was a real person in history, and yes, she was an old neighbor of my ancestors. They live in the same zip code. My hometown was so small that you couldn't find it on the map. How small? Well, when I was 13, the town finally had a bus service. The bus line was called the bus line. So, so we didn't even bother giving it a name. It had a few stops. One stop was called bank. All right? The stop after bank was called market. The most important stop was called a red and a green light, and that's our hometown's only traffic light back then. <laughs> Growing up in a small town, well, I saw my dad making a lot of interesting stuff, such as the chicken cages, the TV antenna, even homemade shotguns. <laughs> my mom called my dad Thomas. In English, Thomas means Thomas. So I asked my mom, Mom, why? Why do you call that Thomas? He doesn't even have an English name. My mom said, well, Thomas Edison. Your dad is our useless Thomas Edison. He can fix any junk for 20 bucks. In my mom's eyes, my dad was doing all kinds of weird things, but in my eyes, my dad was awesome. He was hardworking, always working, independent, and self-sufficient. Later, I learned two English words to describe people like my dad. Number one, hillbilly. <laughs> Number two, redneck. <laughs> so, uh, so my dad is a Chinese hillbilly who doesn't put on sunscreen on his neck. Once upon a time, all human settlements were small towns or villages. As technology and civilization progressed, some towns grew larger and more complex. Some grew to become manufacturing centers. When large cities grow even larger, they attract more businesses. They attract jobs and talents and resources away from small towns. And this leads to a decline in small towns' economy and loss of opportunities for people who live there. It's like the decline of Radiator Springs in the animated film Cars. Like Radiator Springs, small towns have big ambitions. You don't believe it? Well, let's look at Texas. Texas has a lot of small towns, and they are all world capitals. We have a blue bonnet capital, we have wedding capital, we even have a cowboy capital. I love these awesome titles. 
Living in small towns can be so cheerful. Technology is advancing fast, but small towns are left behind. Compared to large cities, small towns have less funding, trained personnel, or infrastructure to implement new technologies. And this leads to something we call the digital divide. In small towns, the digital divide is quite serious. But fundamentally, it is due to our stereotypes against the small towns. Small town stereotypes have gradually formed in literature, forms, and other types of media. Small towns are painted as close-minded, homogenous, isolated, and ignorant. These stereotypes are not fair, but they occupy our mind and make us automatically reject small towns. One of the stereotypes was that, well, there aren't many people living in small towns, so there's no demand for new technology, so not worth the investment. But is this true? Well, I'm a nerd, just like my dad. I, I dug into the census data, and I found the result to be very, very unexpected. If we define small towns as incorporated places with a population of less than 50,000. Then as of July 1st, 2021, there are 18,696 small towns in the US. They're homes to 80 million people. 80 million people, more than 18,000 small towns. The market is tremendous. Small towns around the world have begun to use new technologies to enhance economic competitiveness and improve quality of life. Some towns use remote sensors to monitor water quality, some use smart street lights to promote safety and safe energy. Some rural towns use telemedicine to connect their people to healthcare providers. Since the COVID-19 pandemic, many people have moved to small towns. Remote work options have provided people the flexibility to live and work from anywhere. And this has made small towns attractive options. Small towns have a low cost of living, and this is good. During a time of economic uncertainty, small towns have more housing and outdoor space, slower pace of living, fewer distractions, and people feel more relaxed. And this is important for the current aging world. Despite these potentials, we are still at the very beginning to future-proof small towns with new technologies. How do we implement new technologies in small towns so that they can live up to their potential? Many things need to change, but there's one fundamental thing, and that is education. Education trains young talents to become future leaders to turn technologies into solutions. I'm an educator. I've been working as an educator for two decades. I realize that our higher education systems need significant changes. There is a considerable misalignment between how university courses are taught and how problems are solved in communities. A university course is normally taught by one professor, one expert from one specific discipline. Students are introduced into a knowledge silo. At the end of the semester, you will be tested on how much you know within this silo. It is a comfortable bubble for not only students, but also educators. College graduates will likely continue to stay in that bubble with a limited view of the world and let the stereotypes occupy their mind. But real world problems are complex and messy. In order to understand, untangle, and solve real world problems, we need to cross disciplinary boundaries. Cross disciplinary boundaries. If you're a computer scientist, you need to work with a social scientist to make AI safe and ethical. If you're a bioengineer, you need to work with doctors and nurses to develop new medical treatments. If you're an urban planner, you need to work with engineers and architects to build smart and livable cities. It is a shame that today's universities are not offering enough 
of these opportunities. Fortunately, small towns can provide ideal settings to create such opportunities. Overlooked by the tech industry, small towns are enthusiastic about university community partnership. They welcome students to carry out projects because they believe these projects will lead to solutions they can finally afford. There are fewer layers of bureaucracy in small towns, so it's easier to launch projects. And there is a strong social cohesion and many volunteers in small towns. They can serve as strong champions pounding the table to advocate for students' projects. They appreciate students. They don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. The secret solution here is interdisciplinary service learning. It is a teaching approach that allows students from different disciplines to team up and serve communities through coursework. It is my passion to use this approach to create smart city projects in small towns. It works like this. Well, it looks like a spiral. We start in the center. We start by understanding the needs and challenges in a small town and design experimental projects we call kindling projects. Then we recruit students from different disciplines and the students will develop, evaluate, and implement the prototypes. Students are organized into small interdisciplinary teams. They learn how to think outside the box, outside the silo. They learn how their work is connected to other team members' work. They learn how to become a meaningful consumer of each other's work. Engineering students learn that how plans are decisions are made in communities. And a social science student will learn that a raspberry pie is not a sweet pie of berries and cream but a small, powerful computing device. Students interact with leaders, and residents, and stakeholders. They gain, they enjoy first-hand experience of the world. What they produce will not stay on the shelf gathering dust, but make a positive impact on the communities. What's remarkable is what students produce in year one will be brought to year two. New students continue to develop and improve the prototypes. Former students will come back and serve as advisors. Why do they come back? Because they want to see their projects to be continued, to make a long lasting impact in the communities and leave a legacy. I often tell my students, one day we will all die. It's important. It's important that you leave something to the world. That is your legacy. What is the legacy? Imagine people are at your funeral. They talk about your life. They talk about what you have done. Remember the words that you want people to say about you and consider them as your goals and organize your life around these goals. Well, you see, I use death and a funeral to scare the poor students. <laughs> so year one, year two, the spiral will spin to year three and year four. The spiral will keep spinning until our community client is sick and tired of us. <laughs> well, some of them are here today. Well, they have not been sick and tired of us yet. <laughs> so it takes a whole village to raise a child. Future-proofing small towns with technologies is the same. There are so many factors and actors. I have just offered insights from my limited experience. If you are running a tech company, contact university educators and small town leaders and see how you can benefit from a university community industry partnership, how you can explore the tremendous market of more than 18,000 small towns and how you can access the best talents from that partnership. If you are a leader of a small town and you find it challenging to serve your people because of limited resources, it is time to think about your relationship 
with emerging technologies such as autonomous vehicles, telemedicine, and AI. These are no longer the weird things that only take place in a faraway Silicon Valley. They can become powerful, robust solutions for your town. Not in the future, but today. You and your people deserve them. If you're a student or educator like me, let's work together. Let's gather our courage. Step outside the comfort zone and break the disciplinary boundaries. Let's create a lot of interdisciplinary service learning projects to future-proof thousands of small towns in the world and ourselves. Thank you very much, everyone.